Hi guys, I'm Richard Various, and this is episode 3 of Various Things. This is a weekly short format podcast about anything and everything. On April 18th, 1930, at a quarter to nine in the evening, the BBC reported, There is no news today. They then returned to a broadcast of a concert by the BBC Symphony Orchestra, directed by Sir Henry Wood. I read this the other day on the BBC website in one of those throwback articles, and when I did, I couldn't stop laughing. I wasn't just laughing at the undeniable Britishness of cancelling an evening news segment, curtly announcing it on the air and then playing what could only have been polite, inoffensive piano music in its place. I was laughing at the idea that there could be such a thing as no news. Obviously, stuff happened on April 18th, 1930, which was Good Friday, by the way. For instance, there was an attempted raid on the armory of police and auxiliary forces in Chittagong, Bengal province in what was then British India. A typhoon swept through Latte in the Philippines, causing considerable damage, and amongst other things, American baseball player Jack Stivitz died. It's tempting to decry the BBC back then as censorious, and it's not as if they wouldn't have known what was going on. Prior to the events of April 18th, 1930, the BBC had just installed agent type machines, a kind of precursor to telex. These machines would have allowed correspondents to submit reports remotely, meaning that the newsroom would have at least had the means to stay abreast of the events of the day. So why, according to the BBC, did nothing happen on April 18th, 1930? We could posit a number of explanations for this. Of interest to us here, though, is how, by 1930, the BBC was beginning to assert more authority over what appeared in news bulletins, moving away from a reliance on news agencies such as Reuters. By this time, various government departments were contributing official announcements to BBC bulletins, on everything from when to post letters and parcels prior to the holidays, to heavy traffic conditions. The BBC also insisted that news announcers uphold BBC news values, giving special prominence to parliamentary news and exercising a strict avoidance of, quote, sensationalism. So it just could have been the case that on the evening of Good Friday 1930, when newspapers would not have printed over the weekend, government departments, including Parliament, would have been closed for the holiday, and with no scope to comment on sensationalist topics, there simply wasn't enough of the right kind of news to report about. With nothing that fit the bill, so to speak, the editors and reporters had little choice other than to tell the listening public that there was no news that evening. This is most likely what happened, but still, there's an unsettling feeling to the idea of there being no news, at least from our perspective in 2018, enmeshed as we are in a 24-hour news cycle, incessant social media news feed algorithms and the recent focus on fake news in particular. Indeed, the platforms that we use to get our news these days ensure that we are always up to the minute on our topics of interest, whatever those may be and wherever they may be happening. A number of commercial players have a vested interest in there always being new information to consume, alongside or sometimes supplemented entirely by advertisements. In its own way, it's not as if this hadn't been happening for almost a century prior to 1930 in the form of newspapers and print media generally. But radio was somewhat different. It was still a comparatively new technology. It was only 10 years prior that news radio services had kicked off in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What's more, the BBC is run by the British government and it's therefore not a commercial radio service. It wasn't until 1933 that Radio Luxembourg's English language service offered a commercial competitor to the BBC and not until 1973 that a commercial radio alternative was licensed within the UK itself. Finding a way to utilise this new technology to deliver information to the masses with no real commercial motivation meant that things like an evening with no news were more likely to happen in Britain than in the US where commercial interests ensured that there was always something to tell. Commercial or otherwise, it's interesting to see how a night without news stands out even more starkly when it's seen in the context of the history of news in general. There's an excellent video on the history of news featuring NYU professor of journalism and mass communication Mitchell Stevens, which I'll link to in the show notes. Professor Stevens explains in the video that we as a species all gathered and disseminated news across multiple forums prior to the advent of commercial news services, and that about 150 years ago it became possible to make a business out of selling news with the invention of the steam press, 
which scaled up reach and production of newspapers. The shift from active news gathering and dissemination by everyone to passive news consumption from news services happened with the advent of the news reporter as a profession. The new job of going out and actively seeking news to report meant that news could be sold to consumers as a commercially viable commodity. Groups communicating around campfires, marketplaces, and along travel routes became singular individuals, reporters, presenters, and journalists, communicating with audiences that increased exponentially with each technological advance. The steam-powered printing press, radio, and television meant that one individual could convey information to an increasingly larger, segmented, and more passive audience via a one-way route. Large news corporations and, to a certain degree, governments, with access to the infrastructure and capital necessary to broadcast information to mass audiences, more or less held a monopoly on what information was available to the masses and how that information was presented. With the advent of the internet, however, this monopoly is being dismantled, and once again anyone can create or consume the kind of media that they want to. So the story's gone from everyone exchanging information around a campfire, to technocrats controlling the medium and the message, to anyone and everyone talking about anything and everything, myself included. So the evening of Good Friday 1930 could be seen as either an editorial stroke of genius, a win for those not bothered by trivial matters and preferring piano music to news for the sake of news, or it could be seen as perhaps the starkest example of just how concentrating the means of communication in the hands of a few could be abused. If you haven't already guessed, I'm a big advocate of disseminating the means of communication amongst the widest possible audience, so I'm keen to hear your thoughts about this. What do you think about the events of Good Friday 1930? Let me know in the comments. I'll also include links to further info in the show notes for this week's episode on our Patreon page. If you've enjoyed this week's episode and you want to support the podcast, check it out. There are great rewards for patrons like access to exclusive content, extended patron-only episodes and more, and you can support the podcast from as little as $2 a month. You can find us at patreon.com forward slash various things. So until next time, this is Richard Various and this has been Various Things. Bye for now.